Now we shall begin. You should answer the questions as you listen, because you will not hear the recording a second time. Listen carefully and answer questions one to five. Excuse me. Yes. I wonder if you could spare a few minutes to do a survey on transport. It won't take long.、Uh, no, that's fine. Oh, lovely. The survey is on behalf of the local council. They'd like to know about what transport you use and any suggestions for improvement.、Uh, can I start by asking you how you travel to town today? Sure, I came on the bus. Great. Now, can I get a few details about yourself? Okay. What's your name? It's Louisa. Yes. Hardy. Can you spell that, please? Yes, it's H A R D I E. Great. Thanks. And can I have your address? It's nineteen Whitestone Road. Oh right, I know that area. It's Bradfield, isn't it? That's right.、Uh, is the postcode GT seven? It's actually GT eight two LC. Great. And could I ask what your job is? Are you a student? I've actually just finished my training. I'm a hairdresser. Oh right. And one more question in this section: What is the reason for you coming into town today? Actually, it's not for shopping today, which would be my normal reason,、uh, but to see the dentist. Right. Thanks. Before you hear the rest of the interview, you have some time to look at questions six to ten. Now listen and answer questions six to ten. Now, in this last section, I'd like you to give us some ideas about the facilities and arrangements in the city for getting to and from work.、Mm -hmm. um, any suggestions you have for improvements? Well, something I've thought about for some time is that when I do walk、mm. and I'm doing a later shift. I think the lighting should be better. Yes, good point. And of course, I think it's a real shame they've been cutting down on the number of footpaths. They should have more of those.、Mm. Then people would walk more. Yes, right. And I don't think there are enough trains. That's why I don't use them. You have to wait so long. Thanks. And finally, I'd like to ask your opinion on cycling. As you may know, there's a drive in the city to get more people to cycle to work. Right. But we realise that there are things which the council, but also employers, might do to help encourage workers to cycle to work. Yeah. Well, I have thought about it, and where I work, there are no safe places to leave your bikes. Okay. And also, I'd have to cycle uphill, and on a hot day, I'd arrive at work pretty sweaty. So I think I'd need a shower somewhere at work. <laughs> right. And I suppose the last thing is that I wouldn't be all that confident about cycling on such busy roads.、Mm. I think I'd like to see you offering training for that. You know, I'd feel a lot better about starting if that was the case. Well, that's very helpful.、Uh, thank you very much for your time. No problem. Bye. That is the end of section one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turn to section two. Section two. You will hear a man being interviewed on local radio about a plan to improve a suburb called Red Hill. First, you have some time to look at questions eleven to thirteen.
Now listen carefully, and answer questions eleven to thirteen. Good morning, and welcome again to your city today. With me today is Graham Campbell, a councillor from the City Council. He'll be telling us about the plan to improve the fast-growing suburb of Red Hill. Good morning, Graham, and welcome to the show. Good morning, Carol. Now, Graham, I understand that there has been a lot of community consultation for the new plan. Yes, we've tried to address some of the concerns that local groups told us about. People we've heard from are mainly worried about traffic in the area, and in particular the increasing speed of cars near schools. They feel that it's only a matter of time before there's an accident as a lot of children walk to the school. So, we're trying to do something about that. Another area of concern is the overhead power lines. These are very old, and a lot of people we spoke to asked if something could be done about them. Well, I'm happy to report that the power company have agreed to move the power lines underground at a cost of eight hundred thousand dollars. I think that will really improve the look of the area. As well as being safer.、Mm, that's good to know, but will that mean an increase in rates for the local businesses in that area? Well, the power company have agreed to bear the cost of this themselves after a lot of discussion with the council. This is wonderful news, as the council now has some extra funds for us to put into other things like tree planting and artwork. Before you hear the rest of the interview. You have some time to look at questions fourteen to twenty. Now listen, and answer questions fourteen to twenty. Now, we've also put together a map, which we've sent out to all the residents in the area, and on the map we've marked the proposed changes. Firstly, we'll plant mature pine trees to provide shelter and shade just to the right of the supermarket in Day's Road. In order to address the traffic problems, the pavements on the corner of Carberry and Thomas Street will be widened. This will help to reduce the speed of vehicles entering Thomas Street. We think it's very important to separate the local residential streets from the main road, so the roadway at the entrance to Thomas Street from Day's Road will be painted red. This should mark it more clearly and act as a signal for traffic to slow down. One way of making sure that the pedestrians are safe is to increase signage at the intersections. A keep clear sign will be erected at the junction of Evelyn Street. And Hill Street to enable traffic to exit at all times. Something we're planning to do to help control the flow of traffic in the area is to install traffic lights halfway down Hill Street where it crosses Day's Road. Now, we haven't only thought about the cars and traffic, of course. There's also something for the children. We're going to get school children in the area to research a local story, the life of a local sports hero, perhaps. And an artist will incorporate that story into paintings on the wall of a building on the other side of Hill Street from the supermarket. And finally, we've agreed to build a new children's playground, which will be at the other end of Hill Street, close to the intersection with Carberry Street. Wonderful. Now, what's the next stage? Well, the final plan. Will... That is the end of section two. You now have half a minute to check your answers.
Now turn to section 3. Section 3. You will hear two anthropology students, called Victor and Olivia, discussing their joint presentation about a Norwegian explorer called Tor Heyerdahl. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 24. Now listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 24. Right, well, for our presentation, shall I start with the early life of Tor Heyerdahl? Sure. Why don't you begin with describing the type of boy he was, especially his passion for collecting things? That's right. He had his own little museum. And I think it's unusual for children to develop their own values and not join in their parents' hobbies. I'm thinking of how Heyerdahl wouldn't go hunting with his dad, for example. Yeah, he preferred to learn about nature by listening to his mother read to him. And quite early on, he knew he wanted to become an explorer when he grew up. That came from his camping trips he went on in Norway, I think. No, it was climbing that he spent his time on as a young man. Oh, right. After university, he married a classmate, and together they decided to experience living on a small island to find out how harsh weather conditions shaped people's lifestyles. As part of their preparation, before they left home, they learnt basic survival skills, like building a shelter. I guess they needed that knowledge in order to live wild in a remote location with few inhabitants cut off by the sea, which is what they were aiming to do. An important part of your talk should be the radical theory Heyerdahl formed from examining mysterious ancient carvings that he happened to find on the island. I think you should finish with that. OK. Before you hear the rest of the discussion, you have some time to look at questions 25 to 30. Now listen and answer questions 25 to 30. All right, Victor, so after your part, I'll talk about Tor Heyerdahl's adult life, continuing from the theory he had about Polynesian migration. Up until that time, of course, academics had believed that humans first migrated to the islands in Polynesia from Asia in the West. Yes, they thought that travel from the East was impossible because of the huge empty stretch of ocean that lies between the islands and the nearest inhabited land. Yes, but Heyerdahl spent ages studying the cloud movements, ocean currents and wind patterns to find if it was actually possible. And another argument was that there was no tradition of large shipbuilding in the communities lying to the east of Polynesia. But Heyerdahl knew they made lots of coastal voyages in locally built canoes. Yes, or sailing on rafts as was shown by the long voyage that Heyerdahl did next. It was an incredibly risky journey to undertake. Sometimes I wonder if he did that trip for private reasons, you know? To show others that he could have spectacular adventures. What do you think, Olivia? Well, I think it was more a matter of simply trying out his idea, to see if migration from the east was possible. Yes, that's probably it. And the poor guy suffered a bit at that time because the war forced him to stop his work for some years. Yes. When he got started again and planned his epic voyage, do you think it was important to him that he achieve it before anyone else did? Um, 
I haven't read anywhere that that was his motivation. The most important factor seems to have been that he used only ancient techniques and local materials to build his raft. Yes. I wonder how fast it went. Well, it took them 97 days from South America to the Pacific Islands. Hmm. And after that, Heidel went to Easter Island, didn't he? We should mention the purpose of that trip. I think he sailed there in a boat made out of reeds. No, that was later on in Egypt, Olivia. Oh, yes, that's right. But what he wanted to do was talk to the local people about their old stone carvings and then make one himself to learn more about the process. I see. Well, what a great life. Even though many of his theories have been disproven, he certainly left a lasting impression on many disciplines, didn't he? To my mind, he was the first person to establish what modern academics call practical archaeology. I mean, that they try to recreate something from the past today, like he did with his raft trip. It's unfortunate that his ideas about where Polynesians originated from have been completely discredited. Yes. Right, well, I'll prepare a PowerPoint slide at the end that acknowledges our sources. I mainly used The Life and Work of Tor Heyerdahl by William Oliver. I thought the research methods he used were very sound, although I must say I found the overall tone somewhat old-fashioned. I think they need to do a new, revised edition. Yeah, I agree. What about the subject matter? I found it really challenging. Well, it's a complex issue. I thought the book had lots of good points. What did you think of the illustration? That is the end of section three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turn to section 4. Section 4. You will hear a lecturer giving a talk about Australian rock art to a group of archaeology students. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40. Now listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 40. Good morning, everyone. I've been invited to talk about my research project into Australian Aboriginal rock paintings. The Australian Aborigines have recorded both real and symbolic images of their time on rock walls for many thousands of years. Throughout the long history of this tradition, new images have appeared and new painting styles have developed and these characteristics can be used to categorise the different artistic styles. Among these are what we call the dynamic, yam and modern styles of painting. One of the most significant characteristics of the different styles is the way that humans are depicted in the paintings. The more recent paintings show people in static poses, but the first human images to dominate rock art paintings over 8,000 years ago were full of movement. These paintings showed people hunting and cooking food, and so they were given the name dynamic to reflect this energy. It's quite amazing considering they were painted in such a simple stick-like form. In the yam period, there was a movement away from stick figures to a more naturalistic shape. However, they didn't go as far as the modern style, which is known as x-ray because it actually makes a feature of the internal skeleton as well as the organs of animals and humans. 
The yam style of painting got its name from the fact that it featured much curvier figures that actually resemble the vegetable called a yam, which is similar to a sweet potato. The modern paintings are interesting because they include paintings at the time of the first contact with European settlers. Aborigines managed to convey the idea of the settlers' clothing by simply painting the Europeans without any hands, indicating the habit of standing with their hands in their pockets. Size is another characteristic. The more recent images tend to be life-size or even larger, but the dynamic figures are painted in miniature. Aboriginal rock art also records the environmental changes that occurred over thousands of years. For example, we know from the dynamic paintings that over 8,000 years ago, Aborigines would have rarely eaten fish, and sea levels were much lower at this time. In fact, fish didn't start to appear in paintings until the Yam period, along with shells and other marine images. The paintings of the Yam tradition also suggest that during this time. The Aborigines moved away from animals as their main food source and began including vegetables in their diet, as these feature prominently. Freshwater creatures didn't appear in the paintings until the modern period, from four thousand years ago. So these paintings have already taught us a lot, but one image that has always intrigued us is known as the rainbow serpent. The rainbow serpent, which is the focus of my most recent project, gets its name from its snake or serpent-like body, and it first appeared in the Yam period four to six thousand years ago. Many believe it is a curious mixture of kangaroo, snake, and crocodile, but we decided to study the rainbow serpent paintings to see if we could locate the animal that the very first painters based their image on. The Yam period coincided with the end of the last ice age. This brought about tremendous change in the environment, with the sea levels rising and creeping steadily inland. This flooded many familiar land features and also caused a great deal of disruption to traditional patterns of life, hunting in particular. New shores were formed, and totally different creatures would have washed up onto the shores. We studied 107 paintings of the rainbow serpent. And found that the one creature that matches it most closely was the ribboned pipefish, which is a type of seahorse. This sea creature would have been a totally unfamiliar sight in the inland regions where the image is found, and it may have been the inspiration behind the early paintings. So, at the end of the ice age, there would have been enormous changes in animal and plant life. It's not surprising then. That the Aborigines linked this abundance to the new creatures they witnessed. Even today, Aborigines see the rainbow serpent as a symbol of creation, which is understandable given the increase in vegetation and the new life forms that featured when the image first appeared. That is the end of section four. You now have half a minute to check your answers. 